Hello and welcome to another episode of the Black Dog Sports Podcast. Actually, today is a From the Dog's Mouth. And see, that's the reason why we call it From the Dog's Mouth is because we get people opinions directly from them. All right, so um, today we have a special guest, Mr. Steve Robertson of Stout. And um, Mr. Steve, go ahead and express whatever you want to express to the people, just your opening thoughts coming in. Well, I mean, thank you guys for having me. I mean, uh, you know, I think that's one of the things about this uh, global pandemic is uh, we're kind of finding other ways to communicate with each other. And I think one of the things that we try to do at Gene's page is have some sense of normalcy, continuing to record all the shows and kind of making sure that everybody still has Mississippi State content to discuss. And, you know, some of it's been good, some of it's been bad, but uh, I think it's made us kind of closer in some respects as a family because shows like this one in my show i think it reminds people that uh, there are a lot of ties that kind of bind us together even when games aren't being played all right and um as always i'm going to introduce my illustrious co-host and did i mention um arthur hosey class of 2008 i should have but we're going to start off with the senior member of the podcast mr Derek thomas what's on your mind today oh man nothing steve you know there's an introduction you already know um, I've followed you for a while. I read your stuff. Uh, you already know what you did for me with the flood. So, man, I'm still thankful of that moment. No, happy to do it, man. We're all family. And I just think too weak. It hadn't been too long after we had moved from Baton Rouge when all that happened, you know. And so we lived on off Old Hammond Highway. So you know, you weren't, you know, you weren't too terribly far from where we used to live. And so yeah. I felt like that was the least we could do to help you. Yeah, Lake Old Hammond Highway, what it was for a couple months. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the second eldest member of the podcast, Mr. Kendrick Fat Bully Vivians Wasabi. Yes, sir. What's going on, y'all? Happy to be here. Happy to be in the beautiful, beautiful city of Moss Point, Mississippi. Fresh air. Um, my light is not that great, but I'd rather be outside right now. Um, happy to be here, ready to talk some good old sports. I'm representing for my daughter today, Alcorn State University. She's in the band down there, so that's what the hat's all about. Um, Mississippi State class of 03, baby. All right, and that brings us last but not least, Jeremiah Short. Uh, Jay Short, the song, um, class of 08, took me a little longer than most, took me about five years, so took me a little longer, but uh, it's glad to be here on this podcast today and looking forward to interviewing Steve and hearing some of the cool recruits. All right, so uh, we're going to start off by getting a little bit about Mr. Robinson's background. So when exactly did you become a board? When did you first become affiliated with like Mississippi State? Well, I've been a state fan my whole life. My dad graduated in 1967 from Mississippi State with a degree in agricultural economics and animal husbandry. And so we were raised Bulldogs. We grew up watching the Bulldogs play, came to some big games. And it's always been Mississippi State, you know, for me. And uh, I can't imagine pulling for anybody else. I mean, I, I think we are without a doubt the university that probably best represents the state of Mississippi than any other. And so uh, happy to be part of the Bulldog family. So um, let me ask you about this. When did you first start it, um, becoming a scout? And when did you first kind of get hooked up with Gene? Well, so I wrote on my own from like 97 to 2000. And then uh, Gene offered me an opportunity to do some things for him in 2001. And then eventually I got into covering recruiting. I thought that was a need at our side to be able to uh, to add a little more, uh, you know, coverage, be able to go to golf ball games and get my own video, my own pictures and that sort of stuff. And so I've been with Gene now going on 20 years. Interesting. And um, we wanted to address the infamous 2001 Rose Bowl come in. So for anybody who isn't, for anybody who isn't um, familiar with you, they call you Rose Bowl and kind of give us the story behind that. Well, so in 2001, I wrote a, uh, I wrote a season preview for every team in the SEC. And 
I felt like that year, you know, State's coming off, you know, a winning season of 97, 98, 99, 2000. And we would return a lot of veterans for that 2000 team for the 01 year. And we had a few losses, but we were plugging them in with some junior college All-Americans. And I uh, felt really good about the team. And uh, we were preseason top 15 in most of the polls. And we, uh, you know, we had to go to Gainesville that year. And I just, my thought process is, well, if we ever got them on a neutral field, I thought we could beat them. And uh, everything was awful. I mean, absolutely awful. I said that we would win the West. I thought if we got to match up and rematch against Florida and Atlanta, we had a good chance to win the SEC. Well, back in those days, you know, if you were the SEC champion, you were a good chance you'd be in the BCS. Well, of course, State wins three games that year. And so uh, Small Miss people started calling me Rose Bowl because that year the BCS National Championship game was in Pasadena. And so I thought it was kind of funny. And so I just kind of went with it. I started calling myself Rose Bowl, and they didn't like that, uh, which made me do it even more. And so I took what they intended to be negative and kind of flipped the script because I'm kind of a fan of alliteration. And I thought it was funny. And um, and so whenever they would always make some comment about it, I would say, well, you know, Rose Bowl, it's like Rose Bowl was right again. And so yeah, eventually we ended up selling shirts during all the Hugh Free stuff because uh, anytime that you can remind them that uh, we're smarter than them, I think it's a good thing. Smarter and better. <laughs> well, I know, uh, trust me, I understand. The guy, I guess you probably can't see which side he is to me, but the host, uh, AJS, the Black Dog Sports Podcast thing on his, he all, all reminds me of a moment from 03 when I said that we were going to expose LSU's defense. He's never let me live it. <laughs> That's when we were students. So trust me, I was an 18-year-old student. I didn't probably get what I was saying at the time. But kind of piggybacking a little bit, you know, from 01, around this time, I think, I don't know when the exact transition from being just Jeans Page to working uh, where Jeans Page merged with Scout.com, but kind of talk about that transition to uh, Jeans Page merging and becoming a Scout.com site. Well, so initially, Jeans Page was a complete independent, and uh, most of the big SEC sites were not affiliated with networks. And then uh, we ended up signing a deal to join the Insiders, which eventually became Scout, and uh, Scout was – Without a doubt, you know, the you know, Rivals was kind of a dying, a dying network at the time because they were doing things strictly off ad revenue. And so we had the subscription base we were kind of working from. And so eventually Scout got picked up by Fox Sports and then Fox Sports hired me. And uh, so I worked for Fox and with Scout and with Gene all at the same time. And then, uh, you know, Scout changed hands a couple times and Fox sold us to the original – owners of rivals a guy named Jim Heckman had a group called the North American Media Group we worked with them for a few years and eventually merged with 247 Sports which has been absolutely wonderful for us I don't if I had known how, how great it would be, have been we'd have made this move years ago but uh, it's been great but uh, you know that's a good thing too about in this industry at some point you have a chance to work with or for just about everybody and so I think all those experiences have made us a better site. I want to kind of backtrack a little bit around that time that y'all merged. Around that time in 02, 03, Mississippi State ended up having pretty great recruiting classes. I know we ended up having – we had Delwin Robinson on the show the other day. He, I guess, should have been part of that 02 class, but essentially he came in in 03. Um, talk about which should have been, I guess, now looking back at that time. Mississippi State, as you said, you had said they were going to be a, a Rose Bowl caliber team in 01. That should have been the time that Mississippi State was ready to take off. And that 02 and 03 class should have been foundational when you have players like – Omar Connor, Dale Warren Robinson, Jarius Norwood, Richard Birch. They ended up having some foundational players, but we know it didn't work out that way. So just talk about, you know, your recollections of that 02 and 03 class. And did people feel at the time, I mean, I was younger myself, did they feel that that was going to be a foundational class for Mississippi State? Yeah, well, we thought so. Matter of fact, if you go back and look at, you know, that class with uh, you know, Nick Turner and Jarius Norwood and those guys, I mean, that, that's one of the best recruited classes Jack and Cheryl ever had at Mississippi State. And so we really thought, okay, this, this is the turnaround, you know. But, you know, Coach Cheryl was being, you know, targeted by the NCAA and Ole Miss folks were relentless. And so there were a lot of things going on. Coach's, uh, uh, Coach's wife, Peggy, got cancer. And then uh, his brother uh, passed away. And Coach had to make the decision to pull the plug. And, and so there were a lot of personal issues going on with Coach Cheryl in addition to the professional stuff. And all of that, I think, eventually just kind of grinded down. And you, know, you made some coaching changes. And a lot of people just kind of felt like that Jackie Sherrill's era was ending 
So it made it more difficult to hire uh, assistant coaches. And that's what happens. You know, you, you saw something similar happen at Ole Miss, you know, like when, when Hugh Freeze was going down, you know, it was dead to go kind of overpay for some coaches. And then many of those guys only stayed for a year or so. But, you know, Coach Cheryl went through some of that. And uh, I, I think when you look back and you look at the – we had some we had some sure enough war daddies in that class. But uh, it just didn't translate on the field, I think, because of the turmoil associated with the coaching staff. All right, Derek. Well, I want to I want to go backwards a little bit because, like, a lot of people may not know that – not only did you, you know, scout for Mississippi State, but you also put on camps to help kids get noticed. So talk about the times where you, you know, worked some of the camps to help kids get into college. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, when I first started, I had a different focus. You know, like a uh, you know, scout would have these big combines and they would limit us to about, you know, 15 or 20 spots for Mississippi kids. And they always wanted us to bring, you know, the best and the brightest. They wanted me to bring, you know, Fletcher Cox and, you know, Josh Boyd and Chad Bumpus and those guys. And so I did that and uh, kind of did that to flex on them a little bit to show them that I had the kind of stroke to bring in those kind of kids. But those guys didn't need a combine. You know what I'm saying? It's like they were known commodities and everybody kind of understood who they were and they already had offers. And so I kind of changed my focus. So when I, I had combines in three different locations around the state. I've actually done some on the Mississippi Gulf Coast and Tupelo. I did 10 there, Tupelo. We did a handful in Brookhaven. As I really tried to go out and help those kids that, that were kind of underexposed, but also, too, to help our, our junior colleges, you know, to give our junior college coaches some objective third-party measurables that they could count on, you know, from somebody that just really wanted to help our kids in Mississippi. And Right. And, man, we had thousands of kids over the years. And uh, it's one thing to really look back on. I'm really glad that we did. That part of my life is kind of over. Uh, kind of moved on to some other things. But there are so many kids in Mississippi that have the talent and the ability to play, but they don't always have the exposure. And so uh, when I first started doing those camps, nobody was doing them in Mississippi. And, and then eventually, you know, everybody started doing them in Mississippi. And so I'd like to think I had something to do with that to kind of shine a light on some of our kids in Mississippi. And, giving them a chance to maybe change their family tree and have a, a college education that hadn't always been available to them. Right. Do you think that kind of led to the start of the seven-on-seven seven culture in Mississippi as well? Well, I actually had the first seven-on-seven seven team in Mississippi. And uh, I think that first class we had, we actually won the Southeast Regional Championship and got a bid to go to Nationals in Dallas through the – it's now the Pylon Series. Back those days, it was Badger Sport. But you had Dante Moncrief and Joe, Mur Joe Morrow and uh, – uh, Kyle Russell and uh, Chandler Rogers and, you know, we had uh, Tobias Singleton, you know, and so we won that thing in, in uh, Tuscaloosa and uh, I eventually began coaching high school baseball and uh, it was, just, I couldn't do it anymore. And uh, I hated to kind of turn it over and let other people get involved because I know what my intentions are. I'm trying to help kids in Mississippi. I think some other people try to help themselves. And right. So, uh, so, but yeah, it was, it, again, it was something I was glad I was a part of, but uh, there's, multiple seven on seven teams in Mississippi now and wish all those guys the best. I kind of wanted to ask you just about the scouting aspect. Um, this is something I was thinking about uh, before the interview. Um, tell me about one kid that you were like, you can tell everybody, ha, 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 I got him right, even though all of you said he would be, well, not as good or just okay. And a guy that all of us have, that guy, mine was Renardo Sidney. I, well, I've had plenty. Renardo Sidney is one I thought was going to be great at Mississippi State and didn't work out that way. A guy that you were like, I ended up being so right about him and nobody else was. And a guy where you're like, you just thought they were going to be great. And then it just didn't work out that way. Not to bash the kid, but more to say, you know, you thought they were going to be a superstar and it didn't pan out that way. Yeah, that's a fair question. You know, I can think of a few guys. You know, Mark McLaurin was a guy that I absolutely loved. And I could not get anybody, anybody in the networks to agree with me. I mean, and then, and then, of course, he starts as a true freshman and ends up, I think, leading the SEC in the interceptions. And, and Mark McLaurin's a guy that may, may have been about a half tick slow, but he was a guy that uh, was very, very valuable at Mississippi State. I had him in my top five uh, from the beginning of the recruiting process, and, I, and I, I think we ended up getting three stars for him. And uh, I, I fought hard for that kid, and I don't think that he got a just do. And I think he proved on the field at Mississippi State that he knew exactly how to play football. And the, the thing about him that impressed me 
And every time that I went and watched him play, I saw him play against Kyle. When he played at Collins, I saw him beat Jamal Peters in Bassfield, in Bassfield. And he willed that team, even though he didn't have big stats, he made the people around him better. And every time that I saw him play, he elevated the play of everybody around him. And uh, that's what great players do. And I don't know that I don't know if he even got enough credit at Mississippi State for how good he was. He ended up starting for us as a true freshman. But he was a guy that uh, I was like, you know what, you guys are idiots. And uh, his yeah. guy, this kid's going to prove me right. And he did. And there are a few, you know, there's a few kids. Chris Garrett's a guy that uh, I was really high on. He was in that quarterback class with Clayton Moore and Tyler Russell. Initially committed to Mississippi State and signed with LSU. I really thought Chris had what it took to be a big-time college quarterback and just didn't, didn't pan out for him. And you know, he got to LSU and uh, kind of got sideways down there, didn't feel like he was getting a fair shake. And then he, he kind of bounced around for a while. But he was a guy that I really felt like had a chance to be – if he had come to Mississippi State, I thought he would be on the cover of the program guide someday. And and uh, now he's coaching high school football down in uh, South Florida. And I, he's a great guy, wishing the best. But uh, I don't know that he ever reached his full potential. Um, I only let one of the other guys jump in, but I want to kind of piggyback off that a little bit. Talk about, like, as a scout, like, it, you see things that other people don't see. Of course, they think that this player is just so awesome because they might see some highlights. And I remember Gene told me some years ago that, you know, they might look at four or five minutes of highlight of this receiver just, you know, balling out, but they might have missed those ten drops he had over the other, you know, and all those highlights. So talk about that aspect of you knowing more information information sometimes in the fans you know of course they want to give you grief or maybe how you rated a guy or how you're high on a person or lower on a person but you know you have the information that they don't have they're just looking at you know their highlights and don't understand what their low lights might actually be yeah and that's the thing that people need to understand too even with uh you know with recruiting services today is you're never going to put anything out there to the detriment of a kid you know and so you're not going to get a true scouting video the best way to not to evaluate kids is to see them play live but when that's impossible, you see a full game tape because I can make anybody look like a four star. You give me three or four mm-hmm. ball games, and uh, I can edit that down to maybe 10, 11 clips and make him look like he, you know that he's the next great thing. Anybody looks good in the highlight video, but what does he what does he do when there's adversity? You know, what does he do when the team is losing? What does he do when he's matched up with a kid that's just as talented as him? That's when you kind of find out what they're about. Anybody looks good against bad competition, and so. You know, that's, that's a bigger part of it when you're doing the evaluation process is it's not just one thing. You know, like there are a lot of people that go to these camps and combines, and I've seen a bunch of kids, and I won't mention any names. I've seen a bunch of kids that look like an All-American in T-shirt and shorts, but when the possibility of getting hit is introduced, they run and hide, you know. And there's a lot of receivers that are seven-on-seven superstars, but when they got across the face of a safety in a high school football mm-hmm. game, they get a little shy. And, uh, and so you see that on tape. The game always finds you. And like one of the most valuable lessons that I had is uh, Coach Forrest Hill. had a chance to go visit with him several years ago. And I was high on a certain quarterback. And he told me, he goes, I don't know why you like this kid. And I said, well, he can make all the throws. And I, he said, can he? And so we sat down and we broke down the tape. And he goes, you know, if you ever – he said, what do you notice first? And I said, well, all the throws are in the middle of the field. You know, it's like they're simplifying his reads and all of his all of his throws in the middle of the field. He goes, well, you know, do you think if he could throw the 15-yard out, it would be on his highlight video? And I said, yeah. And so he put a game on of the kid, and they run the 15-yard out over and over, and he's basically throwing the ball in the stands. He couldn't make the throw. And so that's the thing you begin to learn is that people can be carefully packaged to create this illusion that they're this major prospect. But when you watch the full game tape, and there's another – quarterback that uh, went to a, a school in this state not named Mississippi State that uh, yeah. some people kind of sold me on some things I went and watched the kid play and he was like three for 25 in the game and two of the completions were basically check downs and then I go look at the stats and their box score and they've got him like seven for 12 well I had to tape you know and so that's the thing that you realize is there's a lot of people out there that are just trying to get over a little bit. And, the, and I know their, their intentions are good. They're trying to help a kid. But when you put misinformation out there, and then when a kid is really evaluated, I think you evaluate that kid a little more harshly just because of the fact you realize he can't do the things they're saying he can. 
Oh, trust me, I know that. I was listed at 6'1 in high school, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm only 5'10 and a half with my shoes off, so I know. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're all we're all six foot, 200 pounds, and we're on a 4'40. Four, four, you know? I, I would love to be 200 pounds. I ain't been 200 pounds since my name grade years, so <laughs> y'all can go ahead and say I'm 200 pounds. Yeah. So that would be uh, nice for me. Yeah, I know uh, that's a kind of a perfect segue, probably not the best segue, because uh, I wanted to get into some of those recruiting stories. We don't have time for all of them. I'm sure you have many. But uh, this player, Robert Elliott, some years ago, was, that was one of the most interesting recruiting stories in the history of Mississippi State and Ole Miss, I think. Yeah. But he was a player that didn't pan out the way a lot of us yeah. thought he would. And I know I was talking – when we were talking with Dale One, there were even rumors at the time, I remember being on campus, that um, that they were going to shift Anthony Dixon, who ended up being one of the greatest running backs come to Mississippi State, to fullback, for him to come in. So kind of talk about that process of him coming in and just all the drama that went with that and – just, I guess he never panned out at Mississippi State, even though we went through all that stuff just to get him. Yeah, there's a couple of things I'll say about that. Yeah, I mean, you could see even in high school that he was just more raw in his development. He, he was he was a great open field runner. And at Houston High School, in front of Oklahoma, he didn't have his senior year. It was a pretty young team, especially on the O-line. So everything he got, he kind of got by himself. But he, he developed this bad habit of trying to bounce everything outside. So he wouldn't give a chance for plays to develop and holes to open up. When he got to Mississippi State, they began to teach him a little bit. And then he tears the ACL at LSU. And he's really never the same. You know, even though he was right. – he ended up being a good college player, I think he missed reaching his full potential because he never got regained his burst as a, as a running back. You know, he, he had a, a couple of real shiny moments as a freshman. And then he gets absolutely destroyed. You know, DB gets downhill on him and blows him up. And I interviewed Robert, you know, about his recruitment for the book Stark Villains. And we talked about how crazy all it was. And he, he says Coach, Coach Ed Orgeron's one of the best recruiters he's ever seen. But he had relationships at Mississippi State. You know, Keith Fitzhugh was dating his sister, Brittany, at the time. And so we spent a lot of time on campus. And, and the players at Mississippi State are the ones that kind of – it was really more about them than it was about a coach. You know, that he wanted to be with those guys. He had a better relationship. But I think, to be fair, Ole Miss probably recruited him a lot harder. But, you know, the, in the final stretch there, when uh, it was tr apparent he was flipping to Mississippi State, you know, Hugh Freeze and Dan Werner and Frank Wilson all go sit in his house and refuse to leave and Crooms having the in-home yeah. – going to have the in-home visit. And Robert's uncle snuck him out the back door for him to get off and go uh, visit Croom. And then, actually, Robert never even met with Croom. He went and hid at his grandmother's house in Houston because he was trying to get some peace. And uh, it was just insane how all that happens. And I think it kind of exposed, you know, kind of the dark side of recruiting in Mississippi. There were a couple of guys that were Ole Miss boosters that went to Bridget Elliott's house and said they were reporters from the Tupelo Daily Journal and wanted to get an interview with Robert, you know. And that's the thing I think about, you know, if you're a middle-aged man, what are you doing going to some high school kid's house the day before signing day trying to talk to him? I mean, it's like people say, and the robbery is so toxic. Man, it's always been toxic. I mean, always. you know, there's so many silly things that happen. You know, I've written a couple books about that, working on another one now, but it's just, you know, the Robert Elliott thing is just kind of a small chapter and a long, long, long list of uh, crazy stories that have happened between State and Ole Miss on the recruiting trail. I guess, I guess, because uh, I was going to ask about Cam Newton and the initial recruitment before all the drama of the next year kind of went. But I'm going to jump a little bit to the Chris Jones uh yeah. Thing. And that became – it didn't seem like – well, I guess it's two pieces to Chris Jones with it. Initially, he wasn't even rated, and then he blew up and became a five-star. So kind of talk about that process of him blowing up and becoming a five-star. And two, just the, the drama that kind of happened toward the end with him. Um, yeah, yeah. So the first time I saw Chris Jones, he was an offensive lineman playing for Nettleton High School. And he came to camp at Mississippi State, and I saw him, and I'm like, who in the world is this kid, you know? And they're like, oh, yeah, he's a sophomore. I said, yeah, let me get your picture because, you, you know, I'm going to keep up with you. And, uh, and so he kind of got lost in the shuffle at Nettleton, and he goes back to Houston. And, of course, they knew how to use him, and so they put him on the defensive line. And he comes to camp, and I remember seeing him again. I'm like, who is that kid? I said, that's Chris Jones. And at the same time, there was a guy named Chris Jones out of Tower Town. I was like, no, that's not Chris Jones. Chris Jones is over there. And he goes, no, that's the Chris Jones from Houston. And so you see him, and you could already tell. You know, there was just – he had a different special quality about him. And then, you know, State offers him first. They get him committed. And the only – what's crazy about that, too, is when you always hear about the Ole Miss recruiting machine, a lot of that stuff's just noise. But, uh, 
uh, yeah, well, the, the network was disconnected on this one early on because the only two people that came in the spring evaluation period to Houston High School that year was John Hevesy uh, from Mississippi State and a coach from Memphis. That's the only two coaches that went to see about Chris Jones. Now, you hear all Miss people say, that, oh, we always knew about him. No, that's not true. They didn't do their jobs. State got the jump on them, and then ultimately it worked out well for State. And Ole Miss tried to make up some ground late. That's when the network got going, and they're trying to get him to come in with Kim Dietschy and Treadwell and that bunch there. But, you know, Chris's grandmother and his mother especially, I think, were really significant in this. Chris's grandmother never really cared for Ole Miss. And, uh, you know, there's some other people in Chris's life that were kind of pushed him to Ole Miss. And I think at the end of the day, Chris's grandmother and mother were the – the two most important factors in that decision because they believed that going to Mississippi State was better for Chris. And uh, I think in hindsight, everybody would agree Chris absolutely flourished. And then you look at some of those other guys that went to Ole Miss, they haven't really amounted to a whole lot. And so I think the culture at Mississippi State was a lot healthier and Chris benefited from that. All right. I, I have a player I want to ask about. And this is, I guess you could say, one of the most high, pro high profile recruitments to ever uh, go against us. Uh, it's just been so much – there's still a lot of hurt feelings behind this. A.J. Brown, you know, talk talk to us about his recruitment. Kind of dispel some of the false narratives around his recruitment if you if you have that, that information. So the first thing that I would say is I, I don't have the negative feelings about A.J. Brown's life. Right, me neither. And, uh, you know, the, the very first offer he got was Mississippi State, and his mom are – posted pictures of him crying, how overjoyed he was to have an opportunity to go play college football. And so, it, it, but at the end of the day, he wanted to get out of Starkville. And uh, it's not always somebody else's fault. That's the thing everybody thinks about. You, should, you, you want to blame everybody. You know, Mississippi State did everything they could legally do to recruit that kid. And, uh, you know, he really wanted to go somewhere else. And we thought he was going to go to Alabama. And that made sense. And right. it burned a little more because he went to Ole Miss. But if you're objective about it, and if you look at the fact that, you know, Mississippi State was a run-first team under Dan Mullen, and Ole Miss was throwing the ball around, he was going to go there and catch eight, nine balls a game at Ole Miss. If you're a receiver, you don't want to just be a perimeter blocker. You want to be a playmaker. And Ole Miss gave him a chance to do that. And they really out-recruited Mississippi State in that respect because they had more to sell. We're trying to sell a promise of, hey, we want to throw the football. They're selling evidence of saying, hey, look, we made Laquan Treadwell a first-round draft pick we see you in the same light. And so I don't blame him for going to Ole Miss. I hate that he went because I think right. he would have made a better football team. I think 2018, we probably beat Alabama if you got A.J. Brown. You know, maybe you get to Atlanta. I think that, that the wide receiver recruiting was such a, a handicap for Mississippi State under Dan Moe and Billy Gonzalez. If you get an A.J. Brown, it certainly makes Mississippi State a better team. So my negative feelings – are about the fact that Mississippi State missed out on a hometown kid that could have been a difference maker. I don't fault A.J. Brown in the least. I, 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 think, I think he's a great guy. I wish him the absolute best. I saw him at a, a basketball game this year and had a chance to go up and talk to him. And, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he, he kind of kept me a little bit at arm's length. I mean, you know, I, I've developed a little bit of notoriety about all that uh, recruiting stuff, you know, and uh, write a couple books about that. But, uh, but, yeah, he was real gracious. And, I told him, I said, man, go up there and be, a, you know, be an all-pro. Go do everything you can do and take care of your family. And, and uh, that's the thing. I think, when, I think once they graduate and kind of move on, uh, I, I think you can kind of – I think that that kind of removes some of the, the stigma. I, I think it's okay to root for our Mississippi kids once they get in the NFL. Uh, well, I, to, to add on to that, do you think if Mississippi State had signed Raphael – um, the uh, the pro the previous wide receiver from Starkville High that was dominant. Do you think they would have helped them get AJ? Yeah, you're talking about Raphael Leonard, and yes, I yeah, do. Raphael Leonard, I do. And I actually, what's the trip is I went to see AJ his junior year against Columbus, and uh, he had a crack rib. I didn't know that at the time. I go to watch him, and I don't think he caught a single pass. And uh, Raphael Leonard went like ten catches, three touchdowns, two hundred yards. I immediately went and cut up that tape and notified about a half dozen college coaches. I said, I don't know if this kid's on your radar, but he needs to be. And I think if Mississippi State had made the decision to sign him, because we have been so wide receiver poor anyway. Right. And it's like, you know, it's pretty apparent we weren't able to develop wide receivers. And so if you take him, I do think you get A.J. Brown. It's because of that relationship. And I, and I really felt like when they passed on Raphael, I think 
I think it kind of gave a negative impression to AJ too. I mean, that's just, I don't know that. That's just kind of my feeling. Right. And then we end up getting getting Cam Gardner and then AJ came out trumping, I guess you supporting Mississippi State signing Rufus Harvey. So do you think that I had to do about just AJ believing in the kid and not want Mississippi State to miss out on the next great wide receiver talent from Starkville? Because he didn't come out and support us signing Cam Gardner like that. I mean, but Rufus Harvey, he was on that train like, like, hey, don't y'all miss out on this kid. Yeah, I, I don't know the relationship between him and Cam, but he's been very supportive of Rufus. And uh, yeah, Rufus had a ton of support. I, we joke about this all the time. I don't know that anybody rides harder for the kids on our message board than the Starkville High School people do. I mean, you know, they, they love the Yellow Jackets. And uh, you know, my girls graduated from Starkville High, so I feel like we're kind of part of that family. But, uh, you know, the Rufus Harvey thing is interesting. You know, for two years, I had everybody said, man, Mississippi State has got to sign this kid. And you look at him and he's so small and you think, can he handle, you know, the, the demands of, you know, SEC football? And then you see how he gets open no matter who they put on him. You begin to say, okay, well, this kid can help us, you know. Uh, so I'm glad that he was a great late pickup. He took care of his business in the classroom, worked his way into an offer. And uh, I, I think I'm not, I'm not one of these guys that's partial to kids in the backyard. But when you've got kids at Starville High School, they're capable of playing in the SEC. They need to be at Mississippi State. Kendrick? Yeah, well, we talk, well let's, let's keep it at home a little bit. Um, I'm, uh, I was over in Knoxville County for three years. Uh, we got a kid on campus now. Um, do, have, have, has he been getting any um, – Kaziah. I'm sorry, Kaziah. Yeah. Has he been getting any um, – Talks. I mean, not just necessarily Buzz is. Oh, he's going to be a superstar. Thing is, he, any talks about him getting on the field at all? Yeah, I think you know the spring is going to be big for him. You know, when we ever have any type of install practices. You know, you know he was hurt when he got here uh, and hurt most of his senior year. You know, he had that foot injury and all. And so he's a tough kid. I, I've always liked him. You know, I think that he's a guy that can help us. But I think the best thing that happened to Kaziah was Mike Leach getting here. It's because of the fact mm-hmm. that with this air raid offense, I think they'll know how to use him a little bit more than perhaps Joe did. And I don't mean it in a negative way. But, you know, these guys have kind of got this air raid offense down to a science. You know, they're, it's a pretty base scheme. And, and, you know, there's not a lot of option routes. It's just kind of a check with me at the, at, with the quarterback thing. And uh, I think Kaziah is athletic enough and quick enough to play in space that he's going to draw a lot of man-on-man coverage rather than zone, and I think that he's the guy that will play. But, you know, last year, everybody, as we got into bowl practices, you know, even Joe's staff was saying that he, they thought he was ready to make a jump. And so I would like to have been able to see him in the spring under normal circumstances because I think, I think he really benefits from this offense. Um, piggybacking a little bit, I know you mentioned Coach Leach and the air raid offense coming in, and it seems weird now, even three month, three or four months later, now that Mike Leach is our coach. This seems like the strangest thing. Um, we had a chance to have him on. I mean, it's just weird. But kind of talk two, two, two part question. First, just the initial drama that came along with getting rid of more head and coming to Leach. Um, and even as a reporter, because I'm just looking from the outside looking in, I would keep up with the message boards every day. And I know you have to post what we're hearing, but I know fans are probably sending you so many inboxes, want to know what's going on. And it seemed like it would be a little annoying for Mike. I could just. I'm a teacher now, so I can see where some, somebody asks you a question every two seconds. Probably a little annoying, but, you know, you have to post something every day. What we're hearing, you know, just coming around to more getting fired and getting, getting leached. And now just the, the, sight, the excitement now of Leach being our coach in the air raid offense coming to Mississippi State where we're going to throw the ball around 40 times a game. Yeah, it's one of those things, too, uh, uh, Jeremiah. It's, you know, it's part of the gig. Yeah, you know I mean, it's like we're in the information business. And so the thing that I always try to caution people is, you know, Derek Thomas might have got on and asked a question at 10 this morning. Well, I may have already answered it, but when Jeremiah Short gets on at 2 in the afternoon when he has a break, you know, he didn't have time to go search the message board. So we get it. I mean, there's going to be people that ask the same questions over and over. We want to provide that information to them. So it, it never bothers me. I mean, people say, oh, Steve, you've got the patience of Job. I don't know if that's true or not. But, uh, you know, when people have questions, we want our fans to be well informed. And so we try to provide that information to them. But, yeah, I mean, it was one of those things, kind of a surreal moment. You know, when I first heard that Mike Leach could potentially be a candidate, it was actually the weekend after Joe was fired. I mean, within 48 hours, you know, we had the press conference with Joe, and I had a friend in the industry tell me, 
I don't know if you know this, but John Cohen is really, really intrigued by Mike Leach. And, uh, you know, could his offense work in the SEC? And so I kind of filed that away. And then I had a, a – it's crazy how life works. I'm a firm believer and you never get lucky. I think you work hard and good things find you, you know. I was on my way to a book signing in Jackson and I had one of our donors reach out to me and said, why is the Mississippi State playing in Key West? And the guy just happened to be down there on business and saw the Mississippi State playing and knew it was a state playing. Well, then I started putting two and two together. So I called some well-placed donors and I said, what's John Cohen doing in Key West? Is, he, is this Mike Leach thing real? And they goes, you know, I don't know if he's going to pull it off, but I think John's going to kick the tires. And so I put out then, you know, that he was a dark horse candidate, you know, and it's just, it's still one of those things, even when it happened, I'm like, is this really happening? I mean, are we really getting Mike Leach? I mean, one of the most prolific offensive minds in the game at Mississippi State, because it's not traditionally what we do. Right. You know, it's almost like when we hired Jack and Cheryl, and you guys were really young for that, but, you know, when we hired Jack and Cheryl, it was kind of like, well, this couldn't have been our administration's decision. Somebody must have forced this on us because we don't. We always make the safe play at Mississippi State, and so Mike Leach is absolutely not the safe play. Uh, he is a, an incredible coach, but uh, yeah, there's there's a little bit of a circus element that comes along with coach. Yeah, I mean, no, we know. <laughs> there's a lot to that, you know, and so. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to work well because there's no shortage of kids in Mississippi that can run, jump, and catch. You know what I'm saying? And so I think we're going to be able to appeal to a wider range of wide receivers. But I think also, too, because of the over the course of, uh, of his being here, I think we'll develop those guys, too. I think we've got a staff that can take the raw athlete and kind of make them into what they want them to be as a receiver. And I don't know that we've had that in a long time. Right. And, All right. You know, so – Go ahead, Arthur. Okay. So we figured that that's a good segue into the whole flim flam, star villains uh, book and all of the drama that happened with Pastor Freeze and um, <laughs> <laughs> the network, uh, you know, old Miss Dow, all that good stuff. Everybody who's watching this, that's what they really signing up for, you know. So go ahead and give it to us. <laughs> Well, I mean, the bottom line is, you know, Hugh Freeze was a fraud, and uh, and he dared everybody. He's like, he you know, he tweets out, "Hey, come at me, bro," you know. And so it's like, it's so stupid. That's the thing too. That I think it's so dumb. It's like when you've got skeletons in your closet, you can't dare somebody to come find them. And uh, yeah, there was some people. There were a lot of old Miss people that you know. How dare we suggest that he's not who we claim to be? And and. Uh, you know, I had some people come at me and, and tried to, you know, give me some difficulty. So I, I just felt the need to kind of protect myself. And in the process of doing that, I uncovered some information that uh, was a little bit embarrassing to them. And then it's crazy how it works. There was, there was a, a mutual friend, a guy that was friends with me and friends with Tom Mars. And he reached out and he goes, hey, will you talk to Houston Nuts lawyer? And that's where I said, no. I said, I don't even like talking to my own lawyers, much less somebody else's. And uh, and so. He goes, well, he just wants to know, like, if his Houston Nuts name ever come up in the investigation. And, of course, the guy was Tom Mars. And um, Tom contacts me, and he goes, hey, I know you're a little reluctant to talk to me, but um, as a show of good faith and an olive branch to show you that we're serious about helping you, I know you're writing this book, and so I'll give you all the open record stuff that I've been able to get. And, of course, I had some open record stuff of my own. You know, I took Ole Miss, Sports State Ethics Commission, and beat them there. They have, uh, we got appeal. We won in the Hines County Chancery Court. It went all the way to state Supreme Court. We got an opinion there. It was favorable. And so, and that's a weird thing, too, the fact that when you're wrong and you still appeal to the Mississippi State Supreme Court, what, what an absolute waste of our state's resources, you know, that some Ole Miss booster who was guilty would uh, use the legal system to try to hide behind what he did. And, and, guys, I, I wanted everybody to get full credit for everything they did. You know, I mean, I, you're good, bad, or indifferent. I wanted your name in the paper. And so I worked hard to make that happen. And, and so Mars had some information that I didn't have, and he just happened to have a bunch of phone records. And, uh, you know, in the middle of all that, I, I'm trying to help them make their case, you know, that Ole Miss tried to, to slander and defame Houston Nutt. And uh, we were able to kind of connect some dots there, and they're able to settle that case. And in the middle of all that, I said, you know, we've got these other phone records. 
And if you got them, you got to take a swing at them, right? I mean, if you had them, you at least got to hit Google search, right? And that's when I found the phone number that ultimately changed the world and, and changed the direction of Mississippi college football as we know it. Okay, uh -oh. so, um, well, go ahead and talk to us about how the whole Leo Lewis and the, um, the tape and Rebel Rags and all of those people <laughs> – was the booster – well, I don't know if I asked it, but I was wondering if the booster was like the Rebel Raz guy because I remember that was a big thing with him and I think Kobe Jones or something like that also. So kind of how did this whole Leo Lewis thing factor into it? And then, of course, his play on the field, it seemed like he just disappeared after all of this happened. So kind of go into that a little bit. Well, I think the Leo Lewis thing is unfortunate because I, I think it really, really impacted his play. You know, I think – I think he's one of those kind of guys that he, he really is a talented player. I think the stress and anxiety behind all this, you know, really, really probably cost him, you know, a great career at Mississippi State. And, uh, you know, I, when you think about young people, you know, we look at all this stuff through the lens of adulthood. I can't imagine going through this at 19, 20, 21 years old and being a young father and, uh, you know, dealing with the, the, the criticism and scrutiny that he went through, not to mention, you know, he, He's a defendant in, in a civil lawsuit, you know, and you got to go to all this trouble, find that lawyer, and these people are all out to get you. And, and so while I don't know ultimately that they'll get Leo Lewis on anything, I think they, they caused enough stress and anxiety to probably cost him, you know, being drafted in the, in the football, NFL draft. I mean, I, I think he'll probably be an undrafted free agent somewhere, but I do think all of the stress really negatively impacted his career. Um, and so, yeah, but, you know, the actual booster involved with the, um, you know, with the ethics case and all that stuff, he was an attorney out of Jackson. You know, he wasn't a uh, – he wasn't connected with Rebel Rags. And, all. you know, I don't know where all that is, to be honest with you. You know, I, I don't know how that all will un unfold itself or, you know. But, uh, you know, I, you don't hear as much about it anymore. And uh, my hope is is that all that eventually gets dropped because, you know, I think Leo and Kobe have uh, – you know, it, it's over and done with. And I don't know that anybody can say that uh, their business was negatively impacted, you know. Only they know that. But, um, you know, I just think it's one of those things. It's unfortunate how crazy this whole thing got all over football. And uh, many of the people that were involved in it were absolutely guilty. All right. So, before I kick it over to Kendrick, it's two things I want to say. Uh, the first one is that I went to grad school at Ole Miss. And there was a certain – sorry. Oh, I said that um, I went to – oh, yeah. It, it, no, it, it was right. unfortunate. Yeah, I, I it was unfortunate. It was very unfortunate. I give him a hard so, time about that all the time. I used, to, I used to watch the Mississippi State games inside of a certain restaurant that is next to Rebel Rags, and I'm just going to say that it, uh, it's get its name from the um, Hotty Toddy cheer. But that's the side point. I know for a fact that these people had where – the athletes would come in there and their families would eat anything off the menu, and then they would just place it on an account. That's neither here nor there. Doesn't sound very legal, but eh, whatever. Um, <laughs> like, uh, who was the guy? The guy from South Panola, uh, Tony Connor, used to come in there, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, just put everything on account number, whatever, whatever. That's neither here nor there. Second thing that I wanted to say is that I don't believe that Hugh Freeze was getting those hookers for himself. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I, I don't know if you can speak to that, but I don't well, think I, that those I'll, hookers were for him. I'll share, I'll share my opinion. So his travel records kind of matched up with the phone calls, you know. And so, you know, I know there are a lot of people that would like to believe that, you know, that he was providing hookers for teenagers. And I think that's one thing people forget. These kids are not of age, you know, and so, but I, I really don't believe that. I mean, you know, based on what I have seen in the records that I've reviewed, I really think it was more for his own personal use. And what that use ended up being, I guess, is something he'll have to answer <laughs> up with. He was just but praying I, for I, him. I don't believe, I don't believe they were for recruits. I really don't. It was Bible was, study. Yeah, he was just praying for him. You know, he was trying to, you know, lay hands on him and cast out the demons in the name of Jesus, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? So, Ken, what was your question? Well, uh, I'm, I'm going I'm, 
I'm, I'm getting away from AJ right now. So um, you've been pretty much in the locker room. Uh, I want to, I want to get, I want to go to the locker room with you. Um, you say 20 years being um, a sports writer, uh, pretty much from Mississippi State. So you've been through what about four coaches now? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, Cher Cheryl Croom, Mullen Moorhead, and Al Leach. All right. Well, well, let's let's let's. Uh, can we go personal with these guys and like? Kind of like who's your who's your favorite? Who was the biggest turd? Who was the most pleasure to be around and things like that? Well, let's see. Uh, if I had to pick, you know, I, I've never been treated poorly by a Mississippi State coach. Uh, they've all been very engaging. You know, some more cooperative than others. You know, Coach Cheryl was kind of at the end of his career. I've gotten to know him a lot more. You know, kind of since then, and um, I think a lot of Jackie Cheryl. And uh, you know, Jackie really gave Mississippi State people a lot of pride. You know, there were a lot of people that felt like we were the little brother in Mississippi and we didn't deserve to win. And, and he gave Mississippi State people hope. And I wrote this when I wrote about him in Starting Villains. He's the first coach that we've had that spit Ole Miss in the face and then dared him to spit back, you know, because he, he felt like he could hold up his end. And, you know, he really, you know, Bob Tyler, I guess, you know, he was a coach long before I came along, but that's when things began to change. I think Jackie took things to another level. Coach Sylvester Croom was great to me. And uh, I, I don't think there's a finer man around than Coach Croom. He didn't win enough. Simple as that. But it wasn't a situation where he didn't try. He finally had figured out the recruiting piece. I mean, that 09 class that Mullen got credit for, a majority of that was Coach Croom's staff to put that together. But uh, but you know, I, I call racist for saying that, but anyway, <laughs> sorry, I even... that's all right. No, but Kr Kroom was great, man. And uh, I think the thing with coach is, I think he was a little bit too loyal to some assistants, you know, and uh, maybe a little bit too stubborn at times. But uh, he wanted what was best for Mississippi State, and I, you know, I, my hope is now that some time has passed that that can kind of be healed and we can look back at that chapter and kind of be proud of some of the things we did. Uh, and then, you know, Coach Mullen, of course. Mullen's so different than the rest of them. Mullen's got a little bit of Cheryl and a little bit of Moorhead in him. But the one thing about Dan that I always respected is he didn't care what you thought. I mean, he he, he doesn't care. And it's just like with all the Jeff Simmons stuff. You know, when uh, there were a couple people in the media, I won't use their names, but, you know, they, they were kind of, you know, suggesting that Mullen should do certain things. And I told him, I said, here's the thing I don't think you guys get is it, Dan Mullen is the football coach. Dan Mullen doesn't care if you write an article about him or the football team. It doesn't change anything. So you go right ahead and you write your article. You, you think Dan Mullen's going to care what you had to say? I mean, that, that just shows, you know, how self-entitled some, some people in our profession are. When Dan Mullen got on that plane and headed back from SEC meetings after we had enrolled Chris Jones, I mean, pardon me, Jeff Simmons, that's the last time that Dan Mullen worried about what the media had to say. It was behind him. And so he could flush things, and he never really worried about what was being said outside of the building. You know what I'm saying? It's like – and Joe was completely different. Joe, a much nicer guy than Dan, like as far as like – you see Dan, Dan might – one day you see him in the hall, he won't even speak to you, and the next day he's slapping you on the back and, hey, man, I uh, heard things are going great. You know, Joe was a lot more consistent. If Joe saw you at Walmart, if Joe saw you at the Little League game, he'd always come up and say hello. Very engaging. Families loved him. <coughs> he just wasn't tough enough on the kids. You know, he just didn't hold them accountable. But uh, as far as being easy to deal with, he was great. Now, Leach is a little different. You know, it's, we hadn't had a chance to spend a lot of time around him yet, so it's difficult to form an opinion. But like you guys, I had a chance to interview him one-on-one. -on -one, and He was very accessible, and, you know, I, I thought he was great. Uh, so I'm eager to see, but I'll tell you, his staff, I don't know that we have had a staff that has been more accommodating. And maybe it's because of what we're all dealing with right now, you know, so their time is not – the demands on their time aren't quite as great. But uh, it's been great so far. But, uh, you know, I've never – I can never look back and say, you know, hey, I had a bad experience with this guy. I think there's some other writers that uh, kind of go out of their way to try to make Mississippi State look bad that might have a different opinion especially of Jackie Sherrill and Dan Mullen, because there were some writers who were trying to play this gotcha journalism, and that just doesn't get you very far with people. All right. Uh, yeah, Jeremiah. All right. No, 
I guess we kind of can finish up and kind of get to. And since we've wait, 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 like, Jeremiah, like, Jeremiah. Uh, I just wanted to say that this is why we call this segment from the dog's mouth because it's an opportunity for us to get you know information directly from the dog's mouth. You know, instead of us getting secondary information, we're getting it directly from a primary source. You know, so I would you know we love having you on. We want to have you on again. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna just kick it back over to Jeremiah. I'm sorry for that, Steve. It's kind of an inside joke between. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's, all, it's, it's, getting old. <laughs> it's getting old. Also. <laughs> all right. Okay. So, so uh, let's talk a little bit about Stark villains and being able to talk to all those MSU legends. And kind of a part I kind of wanted to get to because, in a sense, this interview is about you, not necessarily Mississippi State sports in general. But talk about a couple of things. That I mean, I know this, but a lot of people don't know that you have had a day job for the most part, most majority of the time that you've been covering Mississippi State sports and been able to give all this great content. You know, you actually had a day job where it was actually a, a, a real, I wouldn't even classify as a true regular day job. You had real responsibilities. So first kind of talk about like having to be able to uh, do all those things and be this, you know, reporter and give all this content while at the same time being someone, I think you were, were you like an area director at that time? Yeah, um, for the, yeah, I was a regional manager with Long Company, and uh, and so that that job ended, I guess, in uh, in two thousand nine, maybe. And so I've been full time as a writer, I guess, you know, for a decade or more now. But yeah, it was difficult. I mean, it was basically like having two full time jobs because I really wanted to write, but I had four kids at home, and so I couldn't afford to do it just on a writer's salary. And so eventually, uh, I, I was able to kind of build up enough of a following that. Uh, you know, Fox Sports gave me an opportunity to write full time, and I still took a pay cut to do it. But it's been one of the best decisions of my life because this is what I was born to do. And you, you mentioned writing books. I mean, it's just like I was so stressed out. You know, I've had some some people in my family that have had some illness, not my immediate family, but people that I love. You know, and so I was kind of depressed about that. And I said, I'm going to make myself write a chapter today. And I get to the second paragraph, and it's like I'm home again. You know, it's like it's just one of those things. It's where I lose myself and find myself. And so, uh, yeah, but writing Stark Villains was incredible. And uh, I'm working on a second one now. And, you know, it's, I, I wrapped up the Jake Mangum chapter yesterday. But it's just, you know, having a chance to tell our story is something that I'll always appreciate. Right. And uh, once again, that's why we call this on the dog's mouth. Hi, right, Jeremiah. <laughs> and speaking more to your story, and I guess we can get to the point of kind of wrapping up, because I wanted to kind of end with a lesson of, you know, even in, in a sense, I want to say you're be on the Mount Rushmore of Mississippi State reporters. I think that's a little oh. overkill. <laughs> but you're probably going to be one of the more prominent names, along with Gene and even, you know, David Murray, who is also another colleague. Um, he's one of the bigger names in Mississippi State sports. But, you know, being able to – someone had some struggles in the past and being able to accomplish it, kind of kind of speak to that, being able to have some struggles in the past and then still be able to accomplish all these things, even though you had to deal with it. Yeah, I assume you're talking about getting recovery. You know, it's like – I've been clean and sober now for 28 years. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm living a life now that I could have only dreamed of back then, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the thing, you know, that's one of the reasons that I'm so open about some of the things that I've been through is because, you know, I think young people need to know that your life doesn't end because you make a mistake when you're 19, which is what I did. And so, you know, I've got a wonderful life and a wonderful family and a wonderful job. But all of that came through making a decision to, to turn my life around and uh, work in a program and, and developing a relationship with a higher power that I choose to call God. And, uh, you know, and having a relationship and then, you know, searching for the right things in life for the right reasons. And um, you know, every day that I get up, it's a gift, man. And I tell you, I've had a couple of friends that have tested positive for the coronavirus. And that's one of those things that's even driven it even you know, closer to home is, you know, when you're around somebody, and they're sick and they're carrying the virus and they end up on a ventilator and you don't even get a sniffle. And it makes you really grateful, you know, that, uh, you know, that there are good things happening in your life. And that's not to say that those people deserved it or anything like that. I'm just saying that every day is a gift. And, you know, that sounds like a cliche, but the times that we're living in now, I think we can fully appreciate the fact that there's a lot going on that we, we can't control, but we can control our attitude and our effort and how we treat other people. And so, you know, coming from those humble beginnings, you know, as a guy that lost everything at 19 years old. And uh, matter of fact, when I got out of jail, 
I, don't, I, don't, I had to borrow money from my mom to go buy clothes. I mean, that's, that's how far down I was. And so, and now I've got a couple of books that have done really well. And, and I uh, got a couple of kids that have ex really excelled doing well at Mississippi State. And, uh, my oldest son was a college baseball player. And, you know, life is good. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot to be proud of. But, but again, it goes back to you have to decide for yourself that I want better. And you got to be willing to work hard to have better. Right. And uh, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, making a mistake when you're young. We had uh, Richard Birch on uh, an episode, which is going to be premiering later on. And he kind of talked about um, – what happened to him and that the bad decision that he made and then him making a decision for himself. And it seems like he's doing better or going to Mississippi Valley, playing football. Now he's married with children, kind of like, like the, the same story you've gone on two different paths, you know, but you still have been able to overcome your struggles in life. Um, so is that the kind of message you want to give to people that, you know, what, well, just because you make that mistake, you know, you still have a life to live after. Yeah, well, it's not, it's not a life sentence, you know, it's, and it's only becomes a life sentence if you let it be. You know, it's like, you know, there are always going to be people that are going to throw your failures back up in your face. No matter how long you live, no matter what you accomplish, there's always those people that are a little reluctant themselves to do anything incredible, so they want to pull you back to their level. Mm -hmm. But you can't let them. And, and to give those people power is, is to admit weakness in yourself. And so I just always look at I count all that as gain. You know, because now I know what it's like to lose it all and then to build it back up and to appreciate it a lot more. And so I think that's exactly right. And Richard's perfectly correct in what he says is you, you have to acknowledge it and not run from it and then build strength from it and let other people know. Because I think that's what really helps other people is when I say, you know what, it wasn't always this good for me. You know, I had some bad things that happened and many of them my own fault. But I'm, I acknowledge my mistake. I learned from it and I work to have better. And that's why I have better. Um, right. I want to thank you for saying that because I know I'll I know if me and Derek were kind of talking uh, before this and I know I, was, I used to do the bully bark line with Gene and I told him before you know last couple of years I've been a teacher and I've done okay doing that I guess I would say and he, he said he could never realize that I was a person who played around and joked around and wasn't doing as well I didn't make any a whole lot of huge mistakes as a kid but he said he's almost shocked by that because I'm always so on it I was like hey I wasn't always like that and it's like I think you know, so I'm glad you said that because, of course, not everybody may necessarily have, you know, had personal issues or substance abuse or anything of that nature, but it might have been other issues they might have had as someone that's just young and not trying to figure it out. So I think, you know, that's a good lesson, I think, for anybody that's a little younger that you're not going to have it all figured out when you're 19 to 20 years old. Matter of fact, you're not even supposed to. Um, but I kind of wanted to end, I wanted to ask, like, just for anybody that wants to kind of get into you, um, to what – you're doing was being a scout, insider, or reporter. What is something that you feel like you could say to them? Because it's it's a it's a I guess in hip hop they say sometimes you're not about that life. And they don't understand what it really takes. What is something that you probably could say to that person who's thinking about jumping in, but they really don't have an understanding of what it really takes to be be um to do what you do? Yeah, it's a great question. And the first thing that I would say is you got to understand you're always working. You know, it's like if you want if you want a job that turns off at five o'clock, then you don't need to get into the news business because you know you never know when news is going to break and you never know you may be in the middle of dinner and you know a kid commits or a kid gets arrested or something happens and you know you, you don't have a normal life and, and, and it's a fun job but it's still a job there are a lot of people that get into this thinking hey I want to go meet the coaches and I want to go have free lunch and that sort of stuff and all that stuff is great but there's a tremendous amount of pressure because there's people like you that you know you don't really give you don't really care about that aspect of it you just want to know what's going on and there's a responsibility that comes with it and I've always done my best when it comes to writing even the will it be the books or whatever is to let the subject tell the story you know you don't want to become the story yourself and there are a lot of people out there that they want to be superstars you know for what they do I'd rather be known for shining the light on other people and letting them shine because that's the better part of being a storyteller it's not not telling my story, but giving other people that may not have the ability to tell theirs their own. But uh, having some humility about the whole thing and understanding you're always working you're, and, and don't ever, 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 ever think you've made it. You always got to stay hungry because there's always somebody fresh coming in out of college or somebody else showing up in the market that might be a little more aggressive than you. So you got to be able to compete always. And if you don't have that doggy dog mentality, you're going to get eight. And you may end up working at Lowe's or something. So, 
AJ? <laughs> All right. So um, I guess that brings us to the end of this particular episode of From the Bulldog, From the Dog's Mouth. Um, but I just wanted to say before we get out of here that that is why we call it From the Dog's Mouth so that we can get it directly from you and not have to get the story from anybody else. And it was a pleasure to have you on. We got to have you on again. And I got to say that as a person who we're breaking into this whole Mississippi State sports media type of thing, you're like the golden standard of what we're trying to aspire to be. Because when it comes to state news, Steve Robertson is the name. And one day we hoping to get there. You know what I'm saying? But y'all gotta work. Y'all gotta work with us a little bit, okay? We finally we brought y'all this Mike Leach interview. We kind of broke a little bit of news and stuff like that. You know, give us some time so that we can be the Black Steve Robertson, okay? So <laughs> you, hey, you, you, gotta, you gotta get some dreads though if you're gonna be the Steve Robertson. So. And a beard. Yeah, I don't think right. I'm growing those anytime soon. I think I think that that ship sailed with me. Couple and some ago. tattoos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Je- so, Jeremiah had to buy a Millie Vanilli wig or something. So. <laughs> I don't think anybody's gonna believe that that ship sailed about four or five years ago. <laughs> Rick James, Rick James wig or something. So, uh, Jeremiah, before we get out of here, you got any last thought that you wanna um, share? Just about anything. Oh, uh, man, I just want to thank Steve for coming on, man. Um, I think it's good that – I think people see the other side, even with the scouting. I think a lot of people don't see that, and they kind of – sometimes with the scouts, they think they're jerks, so they read a guy this or that. And even still, like a lot of the ratings, Steve can request that people be this rating or that rating. But, I mean, the whole network has control over those things. And um, I think, Steve, you told me a couple of years ago that a lot of, you know, Mississippi guys don't get rated high because, you know, a lot of them play a small – our best players have come from – the smaller schools, they hadn't come from yeah. West Point, Starkville, Meridian. Uh, we've had that debate many times on the show. Of course, like, yeah, Fletcher Cox, who came from Yazoo, I think, City or County. I forgot. I know it's two of them. Or Bernard McKinney, as some people call him, BMAC. So I think it's good for people to kind of see the other side of things and what goes into it. So I just want to thank you for coming on the show. And I think I'm um, excited for everybody to kind of see the interview and maybe see another side of you that maybe they didn't know. You guys, thanks for so much for having me. You guys have a good weekend. You too. All right. Derek, right. before we head out of here, you got anything else to say? Well, I just want to tell Steve, man, keep battling them rebels, man. We got your back. You know what I'm saying? You got somebody, you got a, you got black dogs behind you. Whenever you need us to go go shut them to put them. <laughs> Rebel trolls down, we got you because man, some of the way the way you can just make those guys just turn red and blue in the face is just just heroic, man. I mean, just you know, <laughs> if I could if I could do that one time, I would be happy. <laughs> Don't turn well, red and blue, Arthur. You're half rebel. <laughs> And see, that's why we call this segment from the dog's mouth. Because uh, <laughs> you get to hear about, you know, me being a rebel and all of that good stuff. Or I guess I went to Ole Miss. I was not a rebel. I was cheering for them to go to hell in the stands the whole time. And, um, yeah, so normally I would say praise the Lord and go dogs. But he is a traitorous, treasonous dog at this point. Um, I still all our recruits, too. Yeah, you know, that type of stuff happens. So, um, search for us on YouTube if you're listening to this. You know, Black Dogs Black Dogs Podcast, you know, on YouTube. Uh, on Twitter, it'll be Black Dogs Podcast, B-L-K-D-A-W-G-S-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Same thing on Instagram, same thing on Facebook. And um, I guess we go end this one like we end all of them. Okay, bye.